Also, um, she would like to know whether you prefer, uh, whether you, you can have fish at the conference dinner or whether you prefer vegetarian food. And uh, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you. Good morning again. Welcome back for the next talk. Um, so Wolfgang Belsik from uh, Constance will speak about a uh, higher dimensional topology in multi-terminal Josephson matter. Thank you. So thank you very much and thank you uh, to all organizers for uh, inviting me and organizing this great uh, event. Uh, yeah, it would have been nice to meet already two years ago, but uh, anyhow. Now we restart everything like this again. Okay, so I would like to uh, talk about our work on um, higher dimensional topology uh, and actually also lower dimensional topology in multi-terminal Josephson matter. Um, a brief outline just to um, explain the structure um, that I will uh, first introduce, uh, they say some general words about topology and the geometry. Um, and um, then I will introduce the uh, synthetic dimensions in multi-terminal Josephson matter. Also, some people might know it very well here. Uh, and then I will talk about our results concerning microwave wave spectroscopy, which allows to address the quantum geometry. And we'll spend a few slides at the end to uh, show you that there are some interesting phenomena in, uh, in higher dimensions which one can simulate. Okay, you all know that uh, um, uh, one of the paradigm systems of uh, uh, displaying topological effects as a quantum Hall effect, which shows a display a, a quantized Hall conductance. Um, and this is uh, uh, surprisingly accurate. Uh, I, I wrote it despite this order, but actually also, also due to this order, we have these nice plateaus, uh, but they are extremely uh, sharp and that's kind of quite uh, amazing. So that's, uh, there, there is a relation of this effect, uh, which was pointed out, for example, by Laughlin, uh, to pumping, uh, um, adiabatic pumping, uh, by putting the system on a cylinder, and this will become uh, later important. So you have some mag magnetic fields then uh, perpendicular, and you uh, drive a, a field, a flux through, which is an electric field. And this gives you, for example, in terms of these pumping parameters, very easily this exact uh, quantization of E squared over H for the uh, conductance. Okay. Uh, and then this was uh, later related uh, to um, topological effects. Uh, so the quantum Hall um, insulator, if you want, is a, a topological uh, insulator. And this was pointed out by, by Saulus, but I don't want to go into much details here. Um, yeah, I also wanted to point out another thing which was uh, recently um, interesting or found out in, in the context of uh, topological insulators um, uh, doing actually completely different uh, uh, kind of an experiment from a completely different field with uh, 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 angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy and sp spin resolved, so spin polar uh, circularly polarized uh, spectroscopy. So they kind of they can detect actually the spin polarization of the bands and the spin polarization of the bands locally are related to the topological properties of uh, this, um, um, this Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian. And then basically, uh, I just want to point out, they measure, so to say, a difference in the absorption between right circular light, polarized light and left circularly polarized light. And this gives an access to the uh, polarization, uh, which, is, uh, which is here. So this can be actually connected to um, local geometric uh, properties. Um, and I will uh, basically uh, in the end um, also or in the middle of the talk uh, show you how uh, uh, polarized light absorption, what this has to do with, with local geometry or topology. Okay, um, a brief intro to quantum geometry because not everybody might be familiar with this, um, but it's uh, very basic. And actually, I think now I should basically teach it in my basic quantum mechanics course, which I didn't do before, but now I have a feeling it should go there. Um, so if I have a quantum state with a Hamiltonian, which depends on some parameters, um, and if I basically the quantum geometry, just as in classical geometry, is a difference uh, between 
a vector which is transported by some infinitesimal amount in parameter space. Um, and then um, I naively can kind of say, okay, so this will be something like uh, the, this uh, derivative taken product with this uh, psi. Uh, but this is non, uh, not a, a gauge invariant quantity. Um, but one can define, make a gauge invariant a quantity, which is called the quantum geometric uh, tensor, uh, which is defined here. So it's defined in terms of these derivatives um, and some projector. Uh, maybe the exact definition is not so um, important, but uh, one, it, it's in a Hermitian matrix, so it has a real uh, symmetric um, a matrix, which is called the metric, uh, and it has an off-diagonal term, and this is actually exactly the Berry curvature. Okay, this is called the Fubini study metric, um, and this is a Berry uh, curvature. Okay, um, and and so um, yeah, so this, for example, is somehow a measure how much the phase changes if I uh, change my state, and not only the absolute value is so to say orthogonal. Okay, so that's uh, uh, geometry, and then we know Berry Berry phase is if we move along a closed um, circle in parameter space, we collect. Um, geometric phase, uh, so if you do it slowly, um, which is um, uh, then uh, given by this, uh, uh, by this Berry phase, which is um, um, uh, yeah, this geometric uh, phase, um, which has a certain value independent of the uh, value of the, of the path. And it's actually also related to the topology. So if we uh, define um, uh, the first churn number in this way and integrate over the whole manifold, uh, we get an integer. This, so this is a global property. Um, and um, it was shown that this is only an integer um, and uh, actually related, for example, to the, um, if you want, so the Berry curvature of the Landau levels if I integrate it over all, um, 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 over all, over the phase, uh, over the space of, of parameters, I get the churn number, and this is exactly the quantized uh, conductance uh, of the quantum Hall effect. Okay, so this was already uh, the um, uh, intro Induction um, to this uh, uh, geometry, um, and um, I want now to introduce topological Josephson matter and Andreev bound states. Again, this doesn't really need an introduction here. Um, so Andreev bound states are uh, quasi particles in junctions, uh, usually discussed between two superconductors. Um, so they are connecting by Andreev reflection and normal scattering, and form such bound states which which live inside the junction, but also somehow inside the superconductor. Uh, and it's important that one obtains uh, the, the it's, uh, Andreev reflection is phase dependent, and therefore one obtains a phase dependent energy uh, quantization um, uh, condition, and therefore the energy depends on the phase. Uh, and this means that we uh, have that these states, so to say, carry uh, a current uh, and are, can be microscopically related to the uh, Josephson current. Okay, then this formula is already well known. I forgot, it's also well known, so well known that I forgot whom to cite here for this. <laughs> uh, so this is the energy of an Andreev uh, bound state uh, for a tra junction which has a certain transmission T um, and depends on the phase. Um, um, and I um, uh, calculate the phase difference um, uh, so in the transmission probability. So the spectrum is well known. So it's this two, a kind of two-level spectrum which has an avoided crossing if the transmission is finite. Um, and um, so we have these two levels, and one can calculate also the corresponding uh, currents, uh, which are the well-known relations. So we have the standard Josephson relation for small transmissions and the non-sinusoidal relation uh, for um, um, uh, higher transmissions, for example, transmission equal uh, to one. Actually, it should be some absolute value here. It's a bit, uh, yeah. And um, I want to point out, so this currents, uh, so if you integrate, the currents over the phase, obviously, you get zero here. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, and that's um, um, a kind of so. If you adiabatically change the phase, uh, you get on zero a current on average, um, and and that's so to say uh, well known. Now it, it was found that actually this is totally different uh, in higher dimensions. So this is basically one D uh, in the phase, uh, and this was found by uh, Nazarov and collaborators. Um, in, in this work, 2016. Uh, so they considered now a scattering matrix connected to N superconductors, and in that case, uh, the Andreev bound states kind of, uh, um, yeah, seems to, um, um, uh, depends on N minus one superconducting phase differences, and if you want uh, superconducting, N superconducting phase differences, N minus one form an N minus one dimensional uh, Brion zone, yeah, and now we can apply all the things we know from topological insulators 
three-dimensional topological insulators, vial, semi-metals, and so on. All this can be, so to say, uh, synthesized in such a brion uh, zone. Okay? And it's quite interesting that there, that there is a op the possibility to have the stable vial nodes, which, so to say, cross at a certain points and are not destroyed by, a, uh, by a certain uh, perturbations. This is different than 1D, where you get, so to say, this anti-crossing for any kind of perturbation, unless it's protected by some special symmetry, like time reversal symmetry. And in this uh, topological, uh, in uh, Josephson matter, these, so to say, vial nodes exist without any special symmetry. So they are kind of constructed uh, by this. Um, Okay, so basically we look for zeros in, in the spectrum, and uh, this was from this paper, playing around with uh, the scattering matrices. They found some bound states, and then there's one which has a zero crossing. And these points are then located in this prion zone at different, different points. Actually, so this is probably some kind of vile semi-metal uh, thing. <laughs> I'm not really expert in this, uh, but around each point, you, so to say, have a three-dimensional uh, Dirac uh, cone. Yeah? Um, and, and some, they are, of course, connected if you plot the uh, energy. I have some energies later where you can see this. Okay, and then there's interesting, another interesting prediction is that um, so in the topological phase, so if you do not have the, the crossing, yeah, uh, so if you, uh, then you're, so to say, in a, in a uh, let's say, possibly topologically non-trivial phase with a gap, um, and then uh, they have shown that uh, they're using exactly the similar arguments as I I did earlier for the quantum Hall effect uh, that uh, the current, uh, so to say, in a time-dependent, uh, if, if you consider the time-dependent Hamiltonian, it has a, so to say, adiabatic contribution, which is just the energy, uh, but it has also a non-adiabatic contribution, which exactly contains the Berry curvature, right? And then uh, the interesting thing, if I integrate the Berry curvature over all phases, we get an integer, right? So the first term vanishes if we integrate them over both phases, uh, but the second term not necessarily vanishes. And this means we have, uh, uh, using similar arguments, a quantized uh, transconductance in units of four minus 4e squared over h. And okay. Uh, and this means, this was then also calculated, and each time we, we sort of say in this area, in this kind of plane, and if you change the phi 1, phi 2 plane, um, um, then um, we uh, each time the, the so to say plane crosses such a vial noise that Chern number changes by one and therefore the transconductance. Okay, and um, there have been many works uh, following that um, uh, in, um, um, in in the group and also by uh, others and some people are also here um, um, in, in a kind of a different system which I will also uh, mention later. Um, uh, so, and okay, so what motivated us was two things. So first of all, we wanted to, so to say, kind of try to have a more engineering approach to uh, find this Andreev bound states. And the other way is to see what one can do with microwave spectroscopy because we know that this is very, uh, uh, very good uh, to, because you do not connect your system to leads and avoid certain noises which come in and so on. Okay, uh, so this, uh, and, and then we have started to, to look at systems and tr try to figure out when do they have a, a non-trivial uh, uh, churn number, and uh, so the first system we found was rather complicated for superconductors, some kind of uh, dot region, uh, no Coulomb interaction here, uh, and then some kind of tunnelings between all these leads. Um, there's another version of this which has uh, three superconductors and a flux uh, passing through it uh, as a third parameter. Uh, then we investigated also uh, linear systems uh, uh, of this type um, in this work, and all of them show basically some kind of effective uh, low energy um, Hamiltonian, which is of this form, a two by two Hamiltonian, which has a, a D vector, uh, which is so to say related to, um, 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 yeah, it's like a uh, synthetic magnetic field which is controlled by the phases. Okay, finally, we found the simplest model. We just need these two dots and just this number of connections. Uh, and so this also has a, a topologically non-trivial uh, phase, but it's not published anywhere. We just thought, okay, I mean, you can play around with this and, and, and create tons of models now, uh, but uh, I think we first wait until we see something in reality, <laughs> what, is, what can actually be done. Um, yeah, but anyhow, so this was the final simplest model. Okay, uh, so just to, uh, I mean, we described this with the standard uh, non-equilibrium Green's function te technique. Also, we don't need non-equilibrium here, but uh, Green's function techniques, integrating out tunnel couplings, and so on and so on. And then one has this kind of 
a simple result in lowest order in this T0. So this is some kind of perturbative result, uh, which shows nicely like you have an effective magnetic field uh, vector, which you can in, in, in magnitude and in direction tune by, by playing around with these fluxes. And now the question is, does it have a topological phase? And then when first looks, is there a while node? And yes, so if, you, if the absolute value is zero, we have a while node for this set of uh, parameters. And uh, so dispersion relations are shown here. I don't want to, uh, so we have things like a single while node here, but we have also situations where we have two while nodes. So this is a bit like this while semi-metals, which have two while nodes, which are somehow uh, connected. Okay, and um, it turns out that there are, um, so this also four while nodes, and uh, they two are on one plane uh, in the, uh, the one-two uh, plane. And um, then we can calculate the churn number and everything is, in some sense, already now as expected. So the churn number becomes, it jumps at these points um, and it can jump to minus one, plus one, and uh, back again. And this all depends on parameters. And if the parameters vary a bit, uh, and we have investigated this for some examples, uh, these points move around, but they can only be destroyed if they all, if they somehow move together. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, and then uh, let me now come to the point uh, how to um, uh, relate spectroscopy and quantum geometry. Now I'm going to tell you something you already know, but you didn't know that it's related to quantum geometry. Um, so we all know Fermi's golden rule. Uh, so let's start with two levels then. For two levels, actually, this uh, tensor simplifies because you can use a completeness relation. So it's related to such matrix element uh, with uh, um, final state and initial state. Um, and um, for example, the diagonal elements are just this. And if we, uh, for example, drive one parameter, exactly this parameter J here with some amplitude uh, with a certain frequency, um, then we, we kind of, uh, we know we kind of wiggle, at, uh, so to say, the energy if you want. Uh, and then this is just to sort of say what we do then to calculate golden rule. So this is golden rule for this uh, parameter, for this perturbation here. Uh, and we see this has this uh, usual uh, matrix element. Um, which contains a derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the parameter. Uh, and then there is such a relation uh, because these are eigenstates, which basically gives the energy difference. And because now we have the delta function here, uh, this energy difference, so to say, cancels out because the omega. Um, and uh, actually we see that uh, the prefactor, so the line, the, the line intensity is proportional to the diagonal elements of the quantum geometric uh, tensor. Yeah? So this is, uh, as, again, you, everybody knows golden rule, but you didn't know that the line intensity is related to some kind of a geometric uh, property of the, the system. Okay, and now comes the point. Um, uh, now we want to access other quantities, and this can be done uh, by, uh, by, again, looking at the two-level approximation. And now we do not only change one parameter in time, but we change another parameter in time. Um, so vary it with the same frequency, but with a different, with a phase difference, yeah? So that's kind of, in, in, um, my experimental friends told me this is straightforward to implement. I look at you who told me this first time. Uh, uh, so, um, and, uh, but, but in principle, yeah, okay, it's the same frequency, but with a controlled phase difference, yeah? Uh, and uh, uh, so basically you, uh, depending on this phase difference, you make certain lines or loops in your parameter space, yeah? Uh, um, and uh, now you do exactly the same uh, golden rule calculation, um, and as a result, you find that the prefactor, the line width, uh, now depends on this uh, phase parameter, phase shift, uh, and it contains other elements of the quantum geometric tensor, like G, J, K, if J is equal to amplitude K, and the Berry curvature, right? And this means it allows us, in, in principle, to access these quantities by comparing different, let me call it, artificial uh, synthetic polarizations, right? Because, uh, if, for example, if I take phase shift pi over 2, this is like right circularly polarized light uh, or whatever and whatever, and minus the ratio at minus pi over 2, I, I obtain this, this quantity here. Yeah, so then this, the difference uh, in line widths will be exactly proportional to the, quant to the Berry curvature. Uh, and if we take, uh, so to say, linear polarized uh, microwave light uh, in this parameter space, we get the off-diagonal uh, elements. Okay, and then it has to be normalized and so on, but in this way, one obtains the Berry curvature 
um, and all other quantities. And if you want integrating this, one has an independent measure of the churn uh, number. Okay, uh, so that's, uh, that's quite nice. And that's, uh, uh, in some sense, um, already the main um, uh, story here of this part. Uh, let me check, I have 20 minutes, perfect, yeah. Um, um, so that we, we have some recipes, and I have, in the end, I have a list of all the, the references, uh, or you just archive uh, my, my name, for example, or so you will find all the papers uh, with, with, with lots of details about the different systems we consider and what are the parameters and the requirements. Okay, now let me come to the, so to say, um, original title or the main <laughs> word in the title, higher dimensional topology. Um, I, it's a bit a kind of exotic uh, phenomenon because it's, um, I, I don't know of any practical use of it, but uh, anyhow, it's a very interesting physics uh, phenomenon. And you see that very recently there was a kind of highlight article in physics today. So this is a, the, 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 the cover page. And then this is a page by Hannah Price, I, I hope you can read it, um, who did some major works in this. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, it's about simulating four-dimensional physics in the lab. Um, and, um, <coughs> yeah, so and it says in the title, uh, experimental methods to imitate extraspatial dimensions reveal new physical phenomena that emerge in, higher in, a, in a high dimensional world. So there are certain phenomena which are, exist, so to say, only in a higher dimensional world. And um, so I think this was for the first time probably studied in, in, in string theory, for example, because uh, as a person you know, strings live in some kind of a higher dimensional world, but uh, of course it's very difficult to access all these dimensions which are crumpled into the, into the <laughs> into the strings, so um, uh, here we have much better tools. And uh, so there's uh, one example is the 4D quantum Hall effect, and I don't really say anything here about um, the, um, 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 uh, the, the, the real physics behind this and so on. Uh, so the first, this was studied purely theoretically, 2000 watt by uh, Xu Sheng Zeng and uh, I forgot the first name of the second author. Uh, just to, so how to generalize this idea of the quantum Hall effect to more dimensions, yeah? And it was purely theoretically discussed what are the quantities you, did, you have to consider and so on and what is quantized and so on. Okay, um, and, and how, to, how to set this up uh, properly. Okay, then um, let's say first um, ideas uh, to realize this in, in systems of ultra cold atoms. Uh, we're actually by here in this PRL, for example, and then uh, it was realized experimentally in two back-to-back -back papers in, in, in nature, um, um, uh, one with cold atoms and one in, um, um, uh, yeah, sorry, the, the, I forgot, but some kind of photonic generation. And so the idea is, in some sense, uh, uh, I told you that you can think about the quantum Hall effect as electrons living on the cylinder, and then you pump around uh, the cylinder. And so this was realized basically by creating also for, at least in the ultra-cold atoms, a two-dimensional atom system for atoms. And each atom has itself, so to say, an internal degrees, degree of freedom, which is again, uh, has a topology of, uh, of this uh, cylinder. Yeah? So that's the idea. So that's so basically for each point, you have another cylinder of internal coordinates, now here called Y and W, yeah? and uh, then you can play, uh, you, and, and uh, okay, then the, the, the real trick is that many systems have internal parameters, but you have to you know, apply a flux in, in, uh, in this and apply an electric field, a drive in this parameter and so on. So it's, it's rather involved, but uh, you see that it worked out uh, and experimentally was, was shown that there is some kind of quantized response uh, seen then uh, if all these parameters are varied uh, simultaneously. So you have to look at some kind of higher order um, um, response function. Yeah, not like five more, five more minutes. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so let me um, uh, tell you about what is this um, higher, this kind of uh, typical invariant. Okay, internet is unstable, but it's still there. So if, if we talk, uh, so we, we now look at a system which has a twofold degenerate state depending on some parameters. And in that case, uh, because we have, a, we have, so to say, a multi, uh, multi more states, the Berry connection, if you want, um, is a matrix, right? Because it can be uh, calculated between each of those uh, states. 
Uh, and this means that if we move our state around uh, adiabatically, we not only change the phase of the state, but in, if we visualize a spin, we also kind of rotate the spin if you want. Okay, this gives a matrix valued Berry curvature, which has an extra term compared to the other one. Um, and then one can look at topological invariance. For example, the first churn number um, would be just integrating over two parameters, taking the trace of this matrix Berry curvature. And then there's a, a, a invariant which only exists in four dimensions. This is the second churn number, which is this uh, object here. Okay, um, and then one has uh, also in, in this context and also non-abelian Berry phases. So if I go around the loop in parameter space, I, I also change the direction of my spin if you want. Huh? So this is a simple picture. Okay, and now we, we try to simulate something like this, or not simulate, but uh, kind of engineer this in a 4D Josephson matter. And I don't even show the, the system here. It's very complicated, and I hope we can simplify it also in the future. So it's like two quantum dots with some spin splittings and couplings between the levels and between the dots. And uh, it's a bit complicated to search for it because uh, one needs a four-dimensional integral, which is not so fast to do. So when, uh, we kind of used to construct it by, say, uh, uh, construct the Hamiltonian in terms of matrices which uh, have this uh, Clifford algebra, uh, and then they have this eigenvalues, so they automatically have a two dimension, uh, two uh, degenerate uh, states if these matrices are four-dimensional. Um, and then uh, that's what we have to uh, do. Okay, we need five of those matrices, and, and okay, here they are. Uh, and in the end, we succeeded to find some kind of uh, uh, second uh, churn number, um, which, uh, so to say, in certain uh, parameters can take uh, some integer, take, it has to be an integer value, uh, and here we could calculate how it uh, depended on the parameters in this, uh, this internal field, which is, however, taking a different direction for the two dots here, so maybe we can simplify this in the future. Okay, this also shows a non-abelian uh, Berry phase, which means that you just vary one parameter, for example, phi, phi one by two pi, uh, and then you rotate uh, the spin, and the uh, corresponding rotations are here. So in some sense, um, if it would work, it might even have a use as a platform for so-called holonomic uh, quantum computing, uh, which is discussed by some people, but I'm not so sure if it, um, okay, it's, I, at least it's worth to explore, I think. Okay, the last thing I wanted to say before coming to the end is uh, one word about tensor monopoles. Yeah, because, uh, so what is a tensor monopole? It's a generalization of the magnetic monopole, which is a generalization of, so to say, the electric uh, monopole. Um, and I, I kind of don't have time to go through it, but this is the field of a magnetic monopole. And for a tensor monopole, one has a one order higher dimension in the Hamiltonian, which depends on four parameters, uh, and not here like in this case depends on three parameters. Then one can define a tensor cur Berry curvature and calculate it. Uh, and then there's again a, a, a DD invariant. Do, I forgot now the names. D, D, DD is, stands for two names. I forgot the names now. Uh, uh, invariant, which one calculates. And um, in that case, one finds that there's a, a, a tensor Berry curvature. And we found two ways to construct it. I show both because they look rather similar. So this is the first one here uh, is by uh, Andreev states with three dots. The second one is using this method uh, of uh, coupling Josephson junction. I think you will hear more about this later in the conference. Um, and then one can use this, uh, so this was called the bisquid, right? And, uh, and so two coupled bisquids, uh, and then you uh, with three islands, um, and this also can have a tensor monopole. Okay, with this I uh, would like <coughs> Um, to summarize, uh, maybe not go through it in detail, I just wanted to say, okay, microwave spectroscopy of this Josephson matter might be interesting to uh, get access to the quantum geometric tensor and Berry curvature. Uh, we have some ways to realize higher dimensional topology, um, but not yet um, kind of, uh, maybe not yet in the practical uh, proposal. Um, and uh, it's anyhow also in the platform for other um, uh, um, kind of interesting effects, higher, which higher dimensional effects which only exist in higher dimensions. And before closing, I, I would like to thank the collaborators. And here's the promised list of papers, which is also, again, some kind of summary. And I want to particularly highlight the first two persons, Raphael Klees and Hannes Weisbrich, who were two extremely brilliant uh, PhD uh, students, uh, or are. Uh, so Raphael finished last year, is now a postdoc in Würzburg. 
and Hannes Weisbrich is finishing uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the end of this year. Uh, and we also enjoyed a much collaboration with Gianluca Rastelli and Carlos Cuevas uh, in the course of this, uh, this works. And uh, here you see uh, the list of papers we published in the last year and the year before. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for uh, the very nice talk, and thank you very much for being exactly on time. Now the talk is open for, for questions. Can I ask a question from, uh, from the speaker online? Because sure. It's uh, relatively simple. So from Amit Basu online, he asks whether the, well, he asks how is this uh, uh, D vector in the Hamiltonian calculated? Um, for, for some of your models, I, I, I think that's the idea of the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to a tight binding Hamiltonian, but be aware that we have superconducting uh, contacts, um, so which, which basically means, uh, um, uh, so in principle, um, this corresponds to some self-energy and so on. So what we really do is we calculate the, Hamilton the, the Green's function of the system, if you want, um, uh, and then um, uh, um, the Green's function of the system is uh, energy minus, the Hamil minus some effective Hamiltonian plus some self-energy term, or, or okay, bare Hamiltonian plus some self-energy terms. And this bare Hamiltonian plus the self-energy terms, uh, the self-energies contain the superconducting leads, the superconducting phases, and in particular, for example, for energies much smaller than the gap, they, 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 get, they get much simpler and, and energy independent, for example, and this kind of creates an effective, uh, effective Hamiltonian by basically inverting the Green's function and uh, subtracting the, the energy, if you want. So, but the first model is a simple tight binding. In the second, for the, for the 4D Josephson um, um, matter, uh, we also took an account Coulomb, strong Coulomb interaction. So we are basically restricting ourselves, for example, to a space where there's only one electron in the two dots, but it has phase dependent hopping terms. So this is like crossed, crossed and rail reflections or things like this, which is, uh, um, so to say, otherwise the Hilbert space would be very large. But so one can take into account many body effects, which we only did in the simple way to say that let's take some u to infinity so that we have a fixed number of electrons, for example, in the system. Nadav? I always forget. So, so uh, I mean, I'm going to start with a stupid question, just to be sure I understand, and then maybe something a little less stupid. So the first question is, all the dimensions here are compact, right? Yes. Okay, because by definition, basically. So is, is there uh, uh, the possibility of an extended dimension in some sense? And related to that, maybe the, the less trivial aspect is, what's the effect of a weakly coupled environment? Uh, because all these things, uh, w what's robust here? Right. Right, so uh, to the first question, I mean, for the superconducting phase, <laughs> there's no way to, uh, I mean, uh, but of course you could think about making long arrays of Josephson junctions, and then you, so to say, have this dimension as a, and you can Fourier transform it and have some kind of, okay, it's still, in the end, it's always a finite system, yeah? Um, so I'm, I'm not so sure, in some sense, in these phases are always, um, so to say, compact, absolutely, um, but uh, um, I think you could, so to say, by some tricks extend it so that you effectively have a um, non-compact uh, phase. Order of magnitude yeah, your order, exactly. You need something like this, like an order of magnitude difference. And regarding the, the environment? And okay, the environment, yeah, of course, of course, we did the idealized calculation here. So the superconductor is fully gapped BCS superconductor. Um, this is why we get the sharp lines and so on, right? Um, um, so this is why we get, uh, if you want, a delta function in the, uh, um, in the golden rule and so on. So, it, it, so of course, in practice, the, the lines are broadened. And, um, um, but, but I think one thing is that the, the width of a line, uh, okay, it might depend on the phases, uh, the coupling to the environment and other complicated things, uh, which we did not take into account. And I think one should take it into account yeah, uh, but you know, something like, for example, one simple thing is that uh, if, you, if you just uh, add a, an incoherent broadening, right, then of course the, the weight of the line, if you want, doesn't really depend on the broadening. Yeah? But as I said, the, the, the broadening parameter might depend on phase itself, and then you have to uh, figure out how this, uh, um, um, yeah, how this in practice uh, looks like. So one would need a certain model and then uh, uh, include it. But I think it could be included in the approach. Uh, Local coupling can't unravel something? 
Uh, well, I mean, the, 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 the topological invariants, you always have a gap in the system, right? And then, of course, the size of the gap matters. Yeah, so in, it, it's kind of, um, so in the topological phase, you have a gap. So you, we have these closings, but then this is a point where the so, so topology, so to say, changes from either one to the other or from, from, from one to trivial. But otherwise, we always have a gap in the system and how large this gap is. And of course, it's important if this gap can be overcome by some kind of uh, fluctuations, uh, then, of course, um, we are in trouble with the quantized, with the quantized value. Um, and I think I, this is, I mean, if, if, if we have, so to say, um, um, a gap and we have additional noise, so to say, on the, on the phases, we haven't studied this, how this would, for example, exact, um, uh, affect the quantization. But it would have to be correlated noise in order to complete a trajectory, in order to... Well, the question is, does it average out simply? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, and I, I, I don't know, I, I must say I don't know, yeah. But probably we should also go back to works who studied very phases under noise and so on and, and, and look what they did because I think it's rather related. Yeah. We have time for one more quick question, Chala. So I, I was wondering if you think we will find other invariants and if, uh, if you can just comment, do you think um, there are some also applications of uh, these invariants in some way? I mean, uh, for example, as a, not as a, I mean, the first in, the first churn number can be used for a for quantized conductance, yeah. Yes, and the second churn number is a, a is a quantized nonlinear conduct nonlinear. It's not a nonlinear, but it's so to say a response to to three different uh, uh, perturbations, and then you look at the fourth uh, uh, quantity. Um, okay, I I must say I don't know about any practical use for it. And, and, and these are the invariants we so far found. And it, I think it depends on even and odd dimensions and things like this. <laughs> so one has to dig a bit into topology to, to find this. Uh, maybe I can ask a question then. Um, is there some limitation to uh, um, how much you can do with loops of uh, two terminal Josephson junctions uh, to simulate the, or to realize the physics of multi-terminal uh, Josephson junctions? I mean, theoretically, there are no limits. There are no <laughs> limits, theoretically, right? Uh, I can couple 1,000 of them, and they are all coherent. Uh, <laughs> I think if you, uh, so in practice, um, I think you will hear more about this in other talks, but I, because these are charge, I mean, uh, I think charge fluctuations are probably not so good for this, so they, they will certainly limit this somehow, um, and, um, you know, in principle, there are also higher states, and so on, and so on, so you have also some gaps, and if you want to, as if you make systems larger, the gaps usually get smaller, right? And uh, so uh, there are certain limitations um, um, in, um, on that, but I, 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 this is really a question to our experimental friends. I mean, what do you think? How many you can couple together no, and still, still have, so to say, co fully coherent coupling? Yeah? Um, and does it make a difference for the way the microwaves uh, couple to the, to the device? Uh, do you mean now for the Josephson junctions? For, for microspectroscopy of the, for instance, the, the uh, vial metal. You think about crosstalks or things like this? Or yeah, I yeah I, I'm sure that, uh, of course, in, in, in the ideal way, you, you kind of excite one flux in one junction yes. and the others don't see anything. This might be, um, you know, there might be some crosstalks and uh, we haven't investigated uh, the, something the, like, like what, what limits this if we make this, you know, if we make this with two microwaves and we want to have a definite phase difference between them, then of course you probably want to avoid crosstalk as much as possible. Um, uh, uh, it's a good point, I, I don't know. Let's thanks uh, Wolfgang again.